Okay, great. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the My Lloyd Network. Um, we want to start by acknowledging and thanking our very generous um, sponsors um, uh, for their generous support, AstraZeneca and Charisma Therapeutics, as well as uh, UC San Diego Moore's Cancer Center for sponsoring this program. We also want to remind everyone about the um, pre-meeting conference at this year's annual SITSI meeting, which is in San Diego in early November. And we're hosting a um, all day um, myeloid um, uh, centric themed um, um, workshop. And you can register for that when you register for the SITSI annual meeting. And so um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Malay Haldar. He is a physician scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was recently promoted to associate professor with tenure. His laboratory studies mononuclear phagocytes and solid tumors with the overarching goal of targeting these cells for cancer immunotherapy. Dr. Haldar uh, completed his PhD in human genetics under the mentorship of the renowned geneticist and Nobel laureate Mario Capecci at the University of Utah, followed by clinical residency in pathology and postdoctoral research in immunology at the Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Hadler, we're, we're um, very grateful for, your, um, for you being here today to present your work, and so I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction <clears throat> and thanks so much for the invitation. Um, let me share my screen. I think I'm randomly clicking button here. Okay. Um, that looks, so you all see the presenter, presenter mode? Um, actually, you had it right the first time. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, which is strange because we practiced it, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Good now? Perfect. Awesome. All right. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, my lab studies mononuclear phagocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, et cetera. Um, I don't have to give a lot of background to this community, uh, but as you know, um, macrophages and BCs are Sentinels of the immune system, they're present in almost every tissue in the body. Um, they can sense threats through PAMs. Uh, DCs usually get activated, migrate to the lymph node, um, primes T cells, stop T cells, induces T cell response. T cells then come back to the tissue to neutralize the threats. Macrophages uh, can also sense um, these dangers, but unlike DCs, they're usually sessile, they usually stay put and um, regulate the ensuing immune responses by uh, taking on a variety of different uh, phenotypic forms and functional forms like pro-inflammatory M1 macrophage, anti-inflammatory M2 macrophage, so on and so forth. So um, the, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in, this, um, in these uh, cells, mononuclear phagocytes, uh, which are basically monocytes, macrophages, DCs. This is an oversimplification, but just to give you an overview, uh, there are different ontological and functional and phenotypic subsets of these cells. DCs can come from hardwired lineage from hematopoietic stem cells by stepwise differentiation um, of um, you know, pre-CDCs, uh, CDPs, pre-CDCs, and then CDC1s and CDC2s. Um, we'll go into this later during the presentation, but CDC1s are very important for tumor immunity as they can cross-present antigens. CDC2s are actually uh, also uh, comprises of, uh, th there's some heterogeneity within the CDC2 compartment, and they uh, specialize in uh, communication with CD4 helper T cells. Uh, DCs can also come from differentiation of monocytes, and we call them monocyte derived DCs or more DCs. Usually, you see them during inflammatory setting, and it's usually hard to distinguish CDC2s from more uh, DCs using uh, flow cytometry. Uh, macrophages are also very diverse. If you look in any tissue in the body, you will find a resident macrophage, and depending on the tissue type, they look different, they perform different homeostatic functions. Um, et cetera. For example, in the um, lung, you have alveolar macrophages, Cooper cells in liver, red pulp macrophages, spleen, so on and so forth. Macrophages can also come from, or the dogma in the field used to be that they come from differentiation of monocytes, but we realize now that there is an ontological subset of macrophage uh, that comes from precursors that do not go through the monocytic stage. Uh, these are uh, embryonic yolk sac derived precursors. These macrophages seed various tissues. Uh, during embryogenesis and are maintained by local proliferation. 
So uh, generally speaking, my lab is interested in, in, in identifying different subsets of macrophages, species, and environmental factors um, that regulate the fate commitment of these cells into one versus the other. Um, so for the sake of time today, I'll try to go through two stories. Uh, one of them has to do with what regulates monocyte differentiation into macrophage versus dendritic cell and how we can target them, uh, target that aspect for therapeutic purposes. And then the uh, second half of the talk would be um, related to what regulates the differentiation or distribution of CDC1s versus CDC2s. And all of this is going to be mostly focused um, um, to the tumor microenvironment. In other words, what are the factors in the tumor microenvironment that regulates these processes? So uh, the first part of the story, um, actually, um, I mean, initi the, the, the initial part is published. I would go over this uh, relatively quickly. So a few years back, uh, we found that some solid tumors, not all of them, produce a lot of retinog acid. And let me um, put on the, hopefully you can see my pointer here. So uh, these tumors produce retinog acid, which is uh, then sensed by monocytes uh, through the classic RAR, RXR uh, signaling mechanism. And as a result, um, IRF4, which is the transcription factor important for monocytic differentiation into dendritic cell is suppressed. And retinog acid uh, in these setting induces MAFB, which is a transcription factor that promotes monocyte differentiation into tumor promoting macrophage, not just a regular TAM, but TAMs that have tumor supportive function, either directly, uh, which we fully don't understand yet, or through its uh, ability to suppress immune responses. Um, and we made um, several discoveries, which is all in the paper, so I won't uh, go into the details of it. We found that in some cases, tumor cells would produce retinog acid by default. In some cases, they don't produce it, but once you transplant it into a host, they, uh, due to immune uh, pressure, they will start producing it. And one pathway we found out in that paper was TH2 cytokines. In other words, TH2 cytokine like um, IL-4 and IL-13 would induce retinoic acid production by cancer cells. Then there are other tumors uh, that don't produce retinoic acid at all. They just don't like it. It's a pro-differentiating agent. Uh, so tumor cells uh, don't usually write, uh, like producing it. Um, and in some cases, um, it would be the stromal cells that produce retinoic acid. So we found all of these uh, different permutation combination of this pathway. Um, in that particular study, um, so this is just to give you an overview of how retinoic acid is produced. Um, it is produced by metabolism of vitamin A. The alcohol form is converted to aldehyde form by RDH10. Then um, retinoic acid, which is the bioactive form, it has actually several isomer. The most active isomer is all trans isomer. Uh, and that is formed from the aldehyde form, uh, aldehyde form by um, these three uh, enzymes, RDH1, 2, or 3. These three isozymes catalyze the same uh, step. And then um, it's a small molecule that gets secreted by the cells, and then it gets into neighboring cells. In our case, it's the monocyte. And here, retinoic acid then binds RAR, RXR, transcription factor heterodimer to drive gene expression. Now, one point to note here is that there are three different RARs, RAR alpha, beta, and gamma, and three different RXRs. So that leads to quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of um, what transcription factor heterodimers are, are being expressed in a cell. So um, in that, particular paper, um, we were studying sarcomas, um, and uh, the sarcomas that we were using were overexpressing both RALDH1 and 3, not 2. Um, so if you knock out both RALDH1 and 3, we found that you can block RA production, of course. Uh, the cells don't care in vitro. They will still grow. But once you transplant it into an immunocompetent host, you can see that you uh, suppress um, tumor cell growth. Uh, and you can see that once the tumors are rejected, um, they develop memory. So if you rechallenge those mice with the same uh, tumor cell, um, the mice survives. Uh, whereas if you rechallenge them with unrelated sarcomas or unrelated tumor types, uh, they succumb to those tumors. Uh, we also did uh, look for some type of abscopal effect. So you would transplant the knockout tumor on one side and normal tumor on the other side. And the whole point of this experiment was that if you have RALDH1 deficient tumor uh, or RALDH deficient tumors on one side, it will lead to T cell priming, adaptive immune response, which is systemic by nature. And then uh, you start seeing responses uh, to the wild type tumor on the other side. Uh, so the bottom line is um, if you block RA production um, or RA signaling in these sarcomas, you can induce a T cell response. So uh, that led us to think about what are the uh, different ways 
in which we could potentially um, target this pathway uh, as a new uh, way um, for modulating um, you know, immune responses. So uh, identify tumors that utilize this RA-dependent immune evasion pathway. As I mentioned before, not all tumors have this pathway. Then uh, within those tumors, identify which one, which one of the three isozyme is being used by the tumor cell to produce high levels of RA. And then develop RAL-DH isozyme specific inhibitors, which has been very difficult from a structural point of view. Um, there are good RAR inhibitors here that are used as two compounds. They're not used in clinics because there's no indication for that. But RAL-DH specific inhibitors have been difficult to develop. And then uh, once we identify or once we're able to do all of these, uh, think about ways in which we can use RAL-DH inhibitors either as a monotherapy or in combination with RAR blockers so that you completely block the entire pathway. And then in combination with um, other forms of T cell targeted therapeutics or APC targeted therapeutics such as CD47 um, antagonist, et cetera. So we started this um, uh, process after we published the paper that I just showed you before. And from here on, it's all unpublished data. Um, and uh, what we found in, in our initial survey is that hepatocellular carcinomas appear to express high levels of RAL-DH1, not two or three. This is just TCGA data set, RNA-seq data. And this is a human HCC single cell RNA sequencing that was uh, done by this group and published uh, last year. And I'm showing you here PTPRC CD45. So these are all the immune cells. They don't express RAL-DH1. Instead, RAL-DH1 is being expressed mostly by hepatocytes and the cancer cells. And RAL-DH2 and 3 are not expressed at high levels at all. So that got us very interested. We thought that potentially HCCs might be using um, one specific isozyme to produce high levels of RA. So we uh, got into a lab. We didn't study um, liver cancer at that time. We were mostly studying sarcomas at that point. Um, so in collaboration with others at Penn, uh, we got hold of as many HCC cell lines as we could and um, started looking at the expression pattern by um, RT-PCR uh, different RAL-DH isozymes. And as you can see that different HCC, human HCC cell lines have high RAL-DH1, whereas two and three are not usually highly expressed. That is also true for um, murine HCC cell lines, which is shown here. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we started looking at human HCC biopsy samples and the types of tumors and the types of situations that we have looked at with IHC are these. So we had looked at, we have looked at primary HCCs in liver, HCCs that have metastasized to other places, other types of tumors, other types of tumors that are metastasized to um, liver um, and um, so on and so forth. So the idea um, is we wanted to see if high RALDH1 at the protein level is a characteristics of HCCs independent of whether it's located inside the liver or outside of it. And we wanted to make sure that it's not the liver microenvironment that is inducing RALDH1 expression by tumors. Um, and that you can see here clearly that this is a metastatic colorectal cancer in liver that's negative for RALDH1, uh, whereas normal liver cells, which is shown here also in this graph here, as well as liver cancer cells, um, produce high levels of RALDH1. This is a fluorescent assay where essentially higher fluorescence simply means higher capacity to produce retinoic acid. The assay itself is known as ALDE red assay or ALDE fluor assay. And it's been widely used in the field. Initially, it used to, uh, it was used for looking uh, for cancer stem cells because they have um, high RADH activity. Uh, so all I'm showing you here is that if you take human HCC cancer cell lines, they all have a substan substantial portion of uh, the cells expressing uh, RADH1 or RA producing capacity. That is also true in mouse HCC cell lines. Now, if you delete RADH1, um, you lose the capacity to produce um, retinoic acid as shown here by the adiflor acid. So that tells us that HCC cells are really dependent on RALDH1 for high RA production. There is no compensation by RALDH2 or 3 once RALDH1 goes away. Now, if you knock out RALDH1 uh, from human HCC cell line, they grow fine in vitro. They couldn't care less. But if you transplant it into an immunodeficient mouse, it has to be immunodeficient um, to uh, prevent immune uh, reaction. This is xenotransplantation. You can see that although there's no T cell, this is a xenotransplantation setting, RALDH knockout tumor cells grow much slower than their wild type counterpart. 
Now, as I mentioned before, this was the pathway that we published, but in RAL-DH knockout cells, the fact that they have difficulty growing uh, shows you that even without T cells being in the equation, um, you, you see an effect by blocking RA production. So that told us that perhaps in this liver cancer setting, the macrophages have a pro-tumor role and somehow um, RA exposure leads to um, this tumor supportive function in these macrophages. So first I'm showing you that in this xenotransplantation model, if you deplete macrophages, this is a very crude way of depleting macrophages. Essentially, this is a toxin encoded um, in a liposome and phagocytic cells die. Macrophages are highly phagocytic, so you lose macrophages. And if you deplete macrophages, HCC xenotransplanted, um, you know, xenotransplantation-based HCC tumors grow slow. So macrophages play tumor supportive role. This experiment actually was more interesting. So uh, we wanted to know what does RA exposure do to these macrophages. So you would take um, human donor monocytes, you would differentiate them into macrophages in vitro. You would then expose them to retinal acid or not. So there's a control and then RA exposed macrophages. Then you will mix them with human HCC cell lines 50-50, transplant them into a nude mouse, so the um, immunodeficient mouse. And you will ask the question whether RA exposure engenders some type of tumor supportive property in a macrophage. What I'm showing you here is that um, when you combine tumor cells uh, with RA exposed macrophages, um, you can see that those tumors grow faster. Um, that was, um, that was um, surprising to us because you know, you're seeing this difference even 17 days out transplantation. Those macrophages don't hang around that long. Uh, they're not that long lived um, in this setting. So it is doing something profound uh, to the tumor cells um, that's helping them grow faster. So again, all of this was um, in the setting where you don't have a T cell response. So now we wanted to look what happens if you have a, uh, an intact uh, T cell response. So we went to the mouse system. So HEP55 is a mouse HCC cell line. Uh, we deleted RALDH1 much like we did with the human HCC cell line. And we picked two different clones that showed very good deletion. Uh, clone 2 and clone 19, you can see that the um, in vitro defect, in, vi in vitro there is no defect, much like um, human HCC, if you take out rally H1, mouse HCCs grow fine. But once you put it um, in a um, syngenic uh, mouse, you see a profound defect um, in tumor growth. This is much bigger than what I had shown you before um, here with the um, human HCC cell line when you don't have a productive T cell response. So uh, this tells us that um, the presence of T cell uh, leads to an even more profound suppression of tumor growth in the absence of retinoic acid. And this was supported by flow cytometry of these uh, tumor microenvironment or these tumors. You see that you have overall increased number of CD4, CD8 T cells, t rex go down. All the T cells have much higher activation markers like CD69, CD44, et cetera. Dendritic cells uh, go up overall in numbers. TCs were gated as CD11C positive, uh, class two positive, F418 negative cells. And they go up in number and more profound and perhaps way more important, you see that CDC1 fraction goes up dramatically in these tumors. So all of this um, thus far is to convince you that RALDH1 is a good therapeutic target because in, in, for HCCs because it looks like HCCs do produce a lot of retinoic acid and they're completely dependent on RALDH1 for this, uh, for, uh, for RA production. So with this in mind, we started uh, collaborating with uh, medicinal chemists um, at NCATS, specifically Ganesha and Shiming, And we started developing RALDH1 specific inhibitors. And as I mentioned before, that this has been difficult in the field um, based on the structure of these enzymes. And uh, so these are not through um, chemical screening, these are de novo synthesized inhibitors. So we uh, uh, developed a series of these compounds. Two of them show very good uh, characteristics. They are effective IC50s in the nanomolar range, as you can see here. Uh, this is a human HCC cell line. Uh, if you recall, the aldefluor assay shows you RA production capacity. High fluorescence means high RA production capacity. You add the inhibitor, either one of them, compound 91 or compound 96, you completely shut down um, the fluorescence uh, to the same extent as a RALDH knockout um, cell line. You can see from here that the IC50 for RALDH1, which is the same as ALDH1A1, is uh, better for compound 86. Uh, that's also shown here if you um, calculate how much 
reduction in aldiflor uh, activity you get with different concentrations of these inhibitors. Um, so you can see that um, compound 86 is more effective. An interesting thing and completely unanticipated, somewhat unfortunate thing we found is that the inhibitors are species specific. We have a partial crystal structure and homology modeling suggests that the critical um, drug and interacting amino acids are different across the species. So the result is they're profoundly effective in blocking RA production in humans, but not in mouse, which is shown here. Um, so um, this again shows that if you add, so moving forward, I'm going to only show you data with compound 86 because it is much more effective um, uh, compared to compound 91. So you can see that in vitro inhibiting retinoic acid production doesn't matter. That's also consistent with what I showed you before with the knockout system. Um, the interesting thing is what happens when you block RA production using these inhibitors in HCC cell lines. So we created an artificial tumor immune microenvironment. So we will take donors, human donors, we will collect their monocytes and we will differentiate them into dendritic cell in, in the presence of GMCSF and IL-4. It's a common cytokine mix for generating human dendritic cells. But we would also do so in the presence of liver cancer cells themselves or conditioned media from liver cancer cells. So we would use conditioned media or the cells themselves or those cells that have been exposed to the inhibitor. Um, so as you can see, if you culture, at least in this one experiment, monocytes with GMCSF and IL-4, 20% or 21% of them will become dendritic cells marked here by expression of CD1A. And if you treat monocytes with compound 86, nothing happens. It shouldn't because monocytes are not producing retinic acid. If you differentiate monocytes in the presence of either HCC cells or conditioned media from HCC cells, you do suppress uh, dendritic cell differentiation potential of these monocytes. It goes down from 21 to 8%. In some cases, we have seen very profound um, um, suppression. It, it varies quite a bit. And one of the reasons is uh, this is all driven through retinoic acid um, and retinoic acid is kind of unstable. Um, so we think that the potency um, is lost over time, especially for conditioned media. As you can see that if your uh, liver cancer cell are treated with compound 86 or 91 or um, others in the series, you rescue this defect in dendritic cell differentiation. This is um, what we had hypothesized based on that paper that um, uh, I'd shown you before. The same thing is true, whether you add the inhibitor or whether you delete RALDH1 from human HCC cell lines. If you deplete, if you delete RALDH1, you lose RA production capacity and therefore conditioned media from the knockout cell have much higher dendritic cell potential than your control media. And I don't have the data here, but if you add back retinoic acid to this mix, you can again suppress DC uh, differentiation uh, in this setting of compound 86, if it makes sense. So that told us that this RALDH1 small molecule inhibitor is highly potent for suppressing RA production. So what happens when you actually treat tumors with this? So this is HER7, human HCC cell line. This is xenotransplantation setting. There is no T cell. Very unfortunately, as I mentioned, the compound is species specific. We couldn't use mouse system where you have intact T cell, where we think the effect would be even more profound. As I showed you before, uh, based on the difference between mouse RALDH1 knockout and human RALDH1 knockout. So what I'm showing you here is that um, this is your control tumor in black. You treat it with the inhibitor, the tumor grows slower, almost to the exact same extent as you see with the RALDH1 knockout tumor cell. So the degree of suppression of tumor growth is the same whether you knock out the gene or you inhibit the enzyme. And what's more important is if you try to treat a mouse that has the RALDH knockout tumor, you don't have any additive effect, which means that all of the inhibitors effect was going through inhibition of the enzyme itself. And uh, on the bottom, I'm just showing you dose response. Um, we're still working on this. So a higher dose of this um, inhibitor seems to have a more profound effect compared to lower doses. So now that was blocking RA production in HCCs. What if you block RA signaling on the monocyte side? Uh, so we had a dominant negative conditional um, mouse. So this is expressing the dominant negative RAR alpha. So this is specific to RAR alpha, not RAR, not RAR beta or gamma. And the reason we picked this is because monocytes tend to express 
higher levels of rad alpha as opposed to the other two RAR isoforms. So we crossed it to lysite, lys and cre. So we uh, we express the dominant negative form of RARs in, in monocytes and monocyte derived cells. And our hypothesis, if you remember, is RA blockade manipulates, modulates monocyte differentiation. As you can see um, in, in mice that have um, RAR signaling deficiency, HCC tumors grow slow. This is obviously underestimating the effect, mostly because high, very high levels of retinoic acid can still overcome the effects of dominant negative RARs, and that's known in the, in the field. But the reason I showed you that is to set the stage for the idea that a combination of RAR blockade with RADH blockade is even more powerful. Granted, the, uh, the uh, downside here is that RAR blockade um, is usually toxic and you anticipate more toxicity because this is a pan RAR inhibitor that I'm using here. Sorry, the name got cut up. This is actually BMS-493. It's a tool compound. People use it very frequently for blocking all RAR signaling. And I'm showing you here is that you have control tumors, you have tumors that have been treated with compound 86, then you have tumors treated with um, the RAR blocker, the bristol myer compound 493. And when you combine both of them, you have a profound suppression of tumor uh, this is human HCCs. So again, zero transplantation, no T cells here. So uh, where this whole project stands right now is that we have now generated an even more potent form of this RADH1 inhibitor. We call it C97. It has, it is orally available, bioavailable with very good uh, pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, great tissue distribution from what we can tell, uh, and a reasonable half-life. Um, and uh, so we are currently, uh, this compound is undergoing rigorous IND enabling studies uh, because if it goes to clinical trial, it will be first in man. Um, these inhibitors have not been tested before. And as a part of IND enabling studies, obviously, we, uh, we have to deal with the issue of toxicity, right? So off-target toxicity, we have dealt with using commercial assays through CROs. It looks good. Uh, we are also doing metabolite ID from uh, basically looking at what are the major metabolites being produced uh, from this compound in mice and man. And if they're consistent, we can use mouse for toxicity assays. On target toxicity is a problem because this compound has species specificity. To deal with that, we recently made a RADH1 knockout mouse. So this mouse was made by CRISPR Cas9. It's a huge deletion, takes out almost the entire RADH1 gene. The mice are fine. Uh, they breed fine. They're growing fine. No weight differences. Uh, we've looked at serum um, analytes of toxicity. This is mostly looking at LFTs, so liver function tests, they're all normal. And the reason we looked at LFTs is because liver is, looks like one of the sites where RADH1 is very highly expressed. We have also done necropsy and, and looking at various tissues, trying to look at um, well, what other potential toxicity is there. So the idea here is that if the entire global knockout mouse is fine and running around with no overt toxicity, it's unlikely that your temporally restricted limited time inhibition of the enzyme is going to be toxic in humans. Nonetheless, uh, you know, who knows what FDA would want. Uh, so we're now generating a humanized RADH1. We have the knockout, we're swapping it out with human RADH1 enzyme, and we're using autothenous, we are going to generate autothenous HCC tumors in these mice, either using chemical carcinogens like DEN or hydrodynamic shock using plasmids. So the idea is if you, once you have this humanized RADH1 mouse, you can look at both drug efficacy and drug toxicity in the same model system. So this is where we stand um, on the first part of the story. And uh, this is just an example of how um, we found something that the tumor microenvironment produces. We, uh, we think we understand somewhat how it actually regulates monocyte differentiation. And we're trying to leverage that knowledge, to develop new therapeutics to alter the distribution of these cells and tumors, and perhaps uh, at some point uh, combine them with other forms of uh, treatment. And this is only specific to HCCs for now, but we anticipate expanding into other types of tumors. So the second part of the story uh, is rather new, and this is again all unpublished. And this has to do with what is it in the tumor microenvironment that regulates CDC1 versus CDC2 differentiation. Now CDC1 is a very, very distinct population. It, its phenotype is very stable, very uh, easy to identify based on CD103 or XCR1 or CLIC9 expression. And what has always interested me is that if you look in tissues, the distribution of CDC1 specifically is very different from different types of tumors. Tumor seems to specifically suppress CDC1 differentiation. Now, uh, we were very fortunate to have um, Celeste Simon as our neighbor uh, in the floor, as many of you may know. 
Uh, she's a very well-known, um, you know, person studying tumor metabolism and also tumor hypoxia. So Celeste uh, got me interested into um, the issues around glutamine. So uh, as you know, this, um, as you may know, this is a conditionally essential amino acid in anabolic states or rapidly proliferating cells. This becomes essential. Otherwise, it's the most abundant amino acid in the body. And targeting glutamine utilization um, by tumor cell is a promising therapeutic approach that's been under investigation actually for quite some time. So uh, the other reason uh, that I didn't mention of why uh, we went down the glutamine route is we study sarcomas. That has been a longstanding interest of mine since my graduate school days. Um, and sarcomas are glutamine. Many of the soft tissue sarcomas are glutamine oxyproms. So they use glutamine to such an extent that they would create a glutamine deficient microenvironment. And, and that was known. And so that was the other reason uh, I was interested um, in, in this connection between glutamine and immune microenvironment. So one of the first things we did was, okay, if we were to reduce glutamine uptake by the tumor, what does it do to the tumor microenvironment? So we have to reduce glutamine utilization, not completely block it, because GLS is, uh, GLS-1 is the enzyme that converts glutamine to glutamate, which is the major pathway by which glutamine gets used up by the cell. And if you completely, most of the soft tissue sarcomas overexpress GLS, not GLS-1. If you completely block it, uh, we are worried that the tumor would stop growing. So we took a short hairpin approach, pretty good knockdown. Um, this is measuring glutamine using a YS, uh, YSI metabolite analyzer and essentially looking at how much glutamine is being utilized by the cell. So we essentially measure glutamine in the control media and then the media containing either the control cells or the cells where you have knocked down GLS. And so the bottom line here is that if you knock down GLS, you do get less glutamine utilization and that by extension leads to increased glutamine availability um, in, in this media and by extension uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So we took these tumors and these are all mouse fibrosarcomas. So these were generated in a black six background mouse by um, methyl colanthine, which is a chemical carcinogen. These mice produce tumors. This is a very uh, common uh, tool uh, of uh, tumor immunologists. And then um, you maintain these um, cancer cells um, as a cell line. And, and we have modified this in, um, uh, by knocking down the different, um, you know, knocking down GLS. And then we transplant them into a syngenate B6 mouse. As you can see, um, that there is no growth difference, not, not, any, uh, not a significant growth difference, which we had anticipated because it's not really a knockout, it's a knockdown. What was interesting is that we find that knocking down GLS and therefore increasing glutamine level in the microenvironment leads to uh, a, a specific increase in CDC1s by, as a percentage of BCs, as well as overall uh, cell number per gram of tumor, but not so much in CDC2s. And here in the box, um, I'm showing you how we have gated BCs here. Uh, so this is CD45 positive, 11C class two positive, and a 480. Sometimes we use CD64 uh, to rule out macrophages. And CDC1s are characterized by either XCR1 or 103 positivity and negativity for CD11B. So that, that was interesting. So now we wanted to completely block all glutamine utilization. So before I showed you inhibition, of GLS, or rather knockdown of GLS. Um, glutamine gets utilized in many, many different pathways, purine synthesis, gl glucosamine synthesis. There's also redox pathway that I'm not showing you here um, through glutathione production, so on and so forth. GLS inhibition just inhibits one pathway. However, there is a glutamine analog called DON uh, that blocks all glutamine utilization. Now, if you use DON, you see a much more profound effect. Well, first of all, the fibrosarcomas now start growing slower. They were not growing slower when you had GLS knockdown, uh, but here they're really slow, which comes back to my concern that if you really block glutamine utilization, the tumors will start growing slow. DC's overall numbers go down percentage. CDC1 show profound reductions, but not CDC2s. That was interesting. And we started thinking that perhaps this is somehow a model specific thing. What about another model of sarcoma? So fibrosarcoma model was a syngenic transplantation. This is another model. This is an autothenous model. So this mouse has a conditional P53 um, loss and conditional activation of KRAS. This is the same model from Tyler Jacks that if you induce the same um, combination of mutations in pancreas, you get pancreatic adenocarcinomas. In lungs, if you induce the mutation, you get lung adenocarcinoma. 
if you induce the same genetic event in muscle, uh, and the way we do it is um, by injecting TATCRE, you get undifferentiated pleomorphic um, sarcomas. So even here, you can see, although you don't see overall dendritic cell difference, uh, overall DC numbers go down, you do see a very strong CDC1 uh, reduction. So uh, next, uh, we started wondering, well, we, were, we started out by studying tumors, but this doesn't look like this should be tumor specific. What about normal tissue? What if you take a normal mouse and either inhibit all glutamine uh, usage, which is rather uh, profound and dramatic and somewhat unphysiological, uh, or you block glutamine uptake by inhibiting one of the many glutamine import um, importers. And this is a chemical compound V9302. As you can see, um, if you, I believe this is the Dawn. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah, the top, the top row shows Dawn effects. So if you block all glutamine um, activity, um, you know, overall DC numbers grow down. This is only lungs. I'm only showing you lungs, but this is also true for, um, for liver. It is not true for spleen, and I will not go into that because we still don't understand that why that's not the case. Um, but anyway, so in tissue, you see CDC1 reduction as a percentage or as a number, um, and you, can, you also see similar effect uh, with the importer inhibitor. Not as profound, which is expected because the importer only blocks uh, one of the many glutamine importer, whereas DON inhibits all glutamine activity. So next we went um, to the in vitro dendritic cell culture system. So here you harvest, it's a very common system for generating CDCs or conventional dendritic cells. You take bone marrow, you culture them in flit 3 ligand, seven to eight days later, you get a bunch of, a mix of PDCs, a plasma saturated DC, CDC ones and twos. The markers are somewhat different. Uh, here, CDC1 is defined usually by CD24 positivity uh, and um, CD11B or surf alpha negativity, whereas CDC2s are negative for, I'm sorry, miswrote it here. So CDC2 should be negative for CD24 and positive for CD11B or surf alpha. I think I just copy pasted it. My apologies. So in the in vitro culture system, you can also, now you can create glutamine deficiency rather than blocking all glutamine or blocking glutamine importer you can ask the question very directly. So we add different levels of glutamine in the culture system. As you can see, um, CDC level stabilizes at around 500 to 750 nano, uh, micromolar uh, glutamine level. CDC2s as a percentage of all DCs remain stable, whereas CDC1s um, rapidly drop in percentage once the level starts growing below 500 uh, micromolar. Now plasma levels of glutamine are usually at 500 micromolar. And from other people's study, tumor interstitial fluid or TIPS have concentration of glutamine around 50 to 100 nanomolar. I'm sure that differs between different tumor types, but I'm just quoting a number based on one study. So the reason I mentioned that is this is consistent with what might happen in the tumor microenvironments. Low glutamine translates into a rather selective defect in CDC1 differentiation. So we then did a single cell RNA sequencing um, because, you know, we are just looking at one or two markers here by flow cytometry, and the answer was pretty clear. You do have a profound defect in CDC1 um, numbers in those cultures. Based, I'm just showing you some commonly used markers for CDC1s. Um, XCR1, click 9A, TLR3, BATA3, which is a transcription factor specific to the CDC1 lineage within DCs. So that was glutamine deficiency in a controlled in vitro culture system. So now we add DON or the glutamine importer in the culture system. And the bottom line is we end up with the um, exact same result. Uh, DON has a profound effect on CDC1 differentiation um, as a percentage of all DCs, but also as a number. Um, CDC2s don't suffer as much. And the same thing is true for V9302, the glutamine import blocker. So what's going on here? Um, is it, are you blocking differentiation of CDC1s? Are you blocking uh, survival of CDC1s? Are you blocking proliferation of CDC1s? Or is it just an influx of the progenitors uh, in, the, um, in the tissue itself, which is unlikely because we can recreate the phenomenon in vitro. So um, uh, this is one of the um, um, you know, hypotheses out now that in the bone marrow, you have MBPs, uh, macrophage DC progenitors that gives like a common CD progenitor. And then you have pre-committed CDC1s and CDC2s. 
uh, that are called PCDC1s and PCDC2s. Uh, so we are using one of the panel marker panel or flow cytometry gating strategy that was published. Uh, this is from Ken Murphy's lab. And here, pre-CDC1 is defined as linear negative, flip three positive, et cetera, et cetera, shown here. And if you use this KD scheme, you can see that down treatment, even up to nine days, it does not lead to reduced numbers or frequency of pre-CDC1s or overall pre-CDCs in the bone marrow or in circulation. The data here is only showing for bone marrow, but we've also looked at uh, in circulation, which is very difficult because they're really rare cells. And we had to use a lineage reporter called uh, ZBDB46 GFT lineage reporter to make sure that it really is pre-CDCs in, uh, in, the, in the circulation that we're looking at. So we've confirmed this in bone marrow as well as in circulation. So it's not differentiation, at least it looks like that. So what is it? Proliferation? I mean, CDCs can proliferate. It's not great, but to a certain extent, they do proliferate in lungs, and it has been shown before. So we looked at uh, KI67 um, staining by flow cytometry, as well as um, activated caspase 3 um, um, staining uh, to look for proliferation as well as uh, cell death induced upon glutamine antagonism. As you can see here, this is shown in lungs as well as in culture system. Um, the percentage of proliferating CDC1s go down, but that's also true for CDC2s. So both CDC1s and CDC2s go down uh, in terms of proliferation. So that can't explain, at least uh, that is not an obvious explanation of why CDC1s get affected selectively. But if you look at um, active caspase 3 staining, there is a much bigger induction of cell death um, within, um, uh, within, um, within CDC1s. Um, so this is in the lungs. And that's also true if you look at cell proliferation and uh, cell death in vitro. CDC1s and 2s um, both have um, reduced proliferation with glutamine antagonism, but there is a bigger effect in cell death within the CDC1 compartment. So uh, that's probably why uh, we see a selective CDC1 defect number-wise in tissues and tumors. But how is it happening? Is it by conversion to glutamate or, you know, uh, glutamine gets used in so many different ways? Or is it nucleotide synthesis or glucosamine, which is important for UDP glic pack, which is important for targeting receptors, proper targeting of receptors to cell surface. Now, a lot of these things uh, on the cell surface are chemokine receptors, cytokine receptors that are important for CDC differentiation. That would be one reason. Or is it through production of alpha ketoglutarate, right? Alpha KG, which has its own epigenetic um, roles uh, as well as roles within the TCA cycle. So we kind of rule them out one by one and not going through all of the data. So we use that inhibitor that selectively inhibits GLS, so GLS-1, so you block glutamate production. That did not reproduce glutamine deficiency. That's not it, I think. Initially, there was some promising data over there, um, but it turned out um, it, it had to do with a lot of the drug. Then we added um, nucleotides and nucleosides to rescue the defect that we see with glutamine deficiency, and it could not rescue the defect. So Probably it's not nucleotide synthesis. Um, we added glucosamine, thinking that perhaps the receptors are going to now get targeted properly in the cell surface and we could rescue CDC difference. But nope, that was not the case. Uh, we added back alpha KG, uh, or actually um, D alpha KG, which is the cell permeable form of alpha KG glutarate. And here we did rescue overall DC numbers to a certain extent, but we did not rescue CDC1. So there are multiple things at play here potentially, which is not surprising because glutamine is an important amino acid, but at least the phenomenon we are studying, which is CDC1 differentiation, does not seem to be dependent on uh, alpha KG. Uh, and then uh, we explored the uh, mTOR signaling pathway and uh, uh, in initial runs or initial experiments, it looks like uh, treatment of in vitro um, system with rapamycin um, does reproduce um, uh, the uh, glutamine deficiency phenomena. We are not right now trying to confirm it um, using genetic knockouts, TSC1 knockout, conditional TSC1 knockout, um, as well as Raptor knockout. And just to make sure genetically that whether or not this is indeed true. So this was the working hypothesis uh, of, my, of ours in the lab that um, GLUT is a huge competition for glutamine for between tumor cells and CDC1s. And um, because in some tumors where um, glutamine gets used up by the tumor cell, uh, there's a deficient, uh, deficiency of this uh, amino acid, and that affects CDC1 uh, survival and numbers. And that affects, therefore, 
CDA T cell trap. As we were working on this, of course, this paper, this very nice study came out um, from Hongo Chi's lab recently, last month in Nature. Um, the overall message is kind of the same, uh, that glutamine competition is important, uh, but they have a different take. So here, uh, the authors are showing that glutamine deficiency leads to CDC1 functional defect through FLCN1 and F2 uh, that goes through TFAB. And the idea is, if you have reduced glutamine, you have uh, defects or altered um, lysosomal function, which potentially leads to uh, problems in antigen cross-presentation, which uh, happens in the lysosomal compartment, and that leads to defective CD and T cell trapping. So a couple of differences between this story and what we have been developing so far. So here it's mostly uh, the studies are all in tumors, whereas we look also in normal tissue. Here, um, the levels of glutamine deficiency, the experimental strategy is used are less profound, whereas you know, Dawn and others approaches that we have taken um, actually reduce glutamine levels to a very dramatic extent. So what I'm getting at, trying to get at, is uh, the differences has to do with the level of amino acid differences, um, that um, uh, the level of uh, um, glutamine uh, reduction that we're able to achieve. So when the levels are reduced to a sub, some, somewhat reduced, we have a functional defect, which we actually have seen. Um, uh, in our studies as well. Whereas if the levels of glutamine goes down below a certain threshold, then you have defects um, in survival of CDC1. So we're trying to, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to wrap up this study right now in terms of what therapeutic implications it might have. I mean, there have been a spate of recent studies that actually say or uh, posits um, that antagonism of glutamine using DON or a form of DON that gets activated in the, in the tumor uh, is good for T cell activity. Whereas we are finding that a non-specific blockade of glutamine um, might be bad for antigen presenting cells. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, the path forward might be to target the proper cell type with the drug, or perhaps time them differently um, in the context of treatment. So with that, um, I think, yeah, um, almost time. I would like to thank my lab. Um, this is somewhat old picture, I think. Um, so the story uh, that I've talked about today, uh, um, the, uh, we're done by the liver cancer project was done by Shuven and Feng Fei Yu, whereas, and then Samir, whereas the, um, the glutamine um, project was done by Graham Logal. And the glutamine project was done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Silas Simon and my funding here. With that, I'll be happy to take questions. And I believe there's already a few in the chat box. Uh, 